Welcome to part three of the course. Uh, this is going to be about cosmology. One of the most amazing things that's, that's happened over the past half century or so is that cosmology, which is uh, the study of the universe as a whole, uh, has become a scientific subject. Uh, and something that one can say something about in scientific terms rather than merely philosophical terms. Uh, in recent years, in the past ten years or so, uh, there's been uh, kind of a revolution in cosmology uh, which has come about because of the discovery that the vast majority of the universe is made out of stuff uh, that we have no idea what it is. So uh, the discovery is we have no idea what the universe is made of. Uh, and that actually you know, doesn't sound so good. Uh, it sounds like this is a big failure of science somehow, but scientists are clever so we describe it differently. What we, what we claim is that what has happened is that we have discovered dark energy. Uh, dark energy, what is that? We don't have a clue. Uh, but uh, it's most of the universe and we've discovered that it exists. Uh, and so that's kind of where we are right now. And what I want to do over the next uh, four or five weeks is talk about the discovery of dark energy, uh, how that was done, and uh, now that we know that it's there but we don't know what it is, uh, what people intend to do about it. Uh, and uh, this is, I should say, only a relatively small fraction of modern cosmology uh, if you uh, want to know about uh, many of the other interesting things that are going on in cosmology. You have to take a whole course or several courses uh, on this topic. Such courses exist. Uh, I recommend Astro 170 or 220 if you find yourself uh, interested uh, in this kind of thing. But nevertheless, this one particular discovery, and in fact, what I'm going to be focusing on is not just dark energy, but one particular way uh, that dark energy, the first way, there are now other uh, indications that it exists, one particular way in which dark energy uh, has been discovered. And so it's a fairly narrow focus uh, that I'll be taking here, but that will, be that will enable us to get uh, into some depth about how this uh, discovery was made. So let me l uh, let you in on the secret before we even begin. Dark energy is something that uh, you can't see. That's sort of its name. Uh, we've done this twice already, right? Uh, we've discovered planets around other stars uh, that you couldn't see the planets. How do you do that? You look at the star, the motion of the star. We've discovered the existence of black holes, uh, which of course you can't see. How do you do that? You look at the motion of some star that is influenced by the existence of the black hole. So what are we going to do about dark energy? Well, this isn't uh, hard to extrapolate. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the motion of things that we can see and infer the presence of dark energy. And of course, how do we look at the motion? We look at Doppler shifts. Uh, that will be another recurring theme. Uh, and uh, so the plan of action here is actually not so different from something we've done a couple of times before, although the context and the implications and the particular details, uh, needless to say, are. Uh, OK, so let's go back in time, uh, almost 90 years back to 1920. 1920. So supposing one were to give a course in frontiers and controversies in astrophysics in the year 1920, uh, what would one have been talking about? Frontiers and controversies. The big issue, uh, at least in terms of uh, uh, cosmology, uh, was the question of the so-called spiral nebulae. These had been discovered over the previous few decades after the invention of photography uh, allowed pictures of the sky to be created. Uh, and as people took pictures of the sky, what they discovered was all scattered all over the sky are these little spiral clouds, the so-called spiral nebulae. What are these things, they wondered, and in particular, where are these things? And there were two basic hypotheses. One was uh, that these are sort of clouds, uh, uh, shining clouds of gas. These were known to exist in other kinds of shape, shapes. So these are uh, clouds uh, of some kind of glowing gas. Uh, and that they are part 
of our so-called galaxy. Galaxy comes from the Greek word for milk. It's basically Greek for Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is this band of uh, stars across the sky. Uh, it looks like just a white streak. You can't see it in the city with city lights. Uh, uh, you know, if you've never seen this, go somewhere dark, wait till the moon goes down, get your eyes adapted, and, and look for the Milky Way. It's really very spectacular. Uh, if you really want to do this right, do it in the southern hemisphere. Uh, because the center of our galaxy is down there. It's, it's quite spectacular. Uh, anyway, uh, it had been known since Galileo's time that what the Milky Way really was was a band of stars. And so that there's this huge bunch of stars out there, uh, so faint, so packed together, we see it just as a continuous band of light. Uh, and so all these stars, that's our galaxy. Uh, and the question was whether these spiral nebulae might be little clouds of something or other scattered around our galaxy. The alternative. Uh, less popular at the time, but perhaps more spectacular, is that the spiral nebulae are galaxies themselves, are whole galaxies of stars, different from our own galaxy. These were sometimes referred to as island universes. So the Milky Way is our own galaxy, and each one of these tiny little spiral things is a galaxy itself located much, much further away, obviously, than any of the stars that we can see. And you can, you can see that this is a question of some importance, in particular to how big you think the universe is. If all these uh, uh, spiral nebulae are part of our own galaxy, then maybe what the universe is is, a, is one galaxy. Uh, and at that time, it was already starting to be known how big the galaxy was and so forth. Uh, but if each one of them's its own galaxy, then uh, obviously the entire universe must be much, much bigger because it contains uh, thousands, perhaps millions of individual galaxies, each of them more or less like our own. So we know what the answer is going to turn out to be. Uh, this is correct. But they didn't know that in 1920. And in fact, they staged what was called the Great Debate uh, in 1920 between a very famous uh, astronomer named Harlow Shapley, who was at Harvard. And he uh, uh, maintained that the uh, spiral nebulae must be part of our own galaxy. Uh, and so he had. Uh, many good reasons to think this. Uh, there was a lot of evidence that uh, these spiral nebulae couldn't be that far away. Uh, they must be really quite nearby. And so Shapley had, in the true Harvard manner, uh, all of the right arguments and was completely wrong. Uh, and uh, his opponent, a man named Curtis, educated at Yale, but at that point wor working somewhere else, turned out to be entirely right, uh, but, uh, but totally lost the debate because he just didn't have that much evidence backing him up. Uh, so the intuition of the Yale man comes through. Uh, so this is a famous incident in uh, the history of science. Uh, it garnered enormous attention at the time. Uh, remember, this is a year after the eclipse expedition has verified Einstein's theory of general relativity, so people are pretty excited about modern science at the time. Uh, and this was reported widely in the press. So uh, this is another one of our sort of science fables here, uh, the great debate. And one version of the moral of this story might be uh, you can have all the right arguments and still be wrong. Have many uh, good arguments uh, and still be wrong. Uh, as Mr. Shapley uh, turned out to be. Interestingly, at the time, in 1920, they thought, you know, it's going to take us a long time to, you know, really get to the truth of this, and that turned out not to be the case. Within just a few years after the debate had taken place, this problem was totally solved. And the man who solved it uh, was uh, perhaps the greatest uh, observational astronomer of the 20th century, uh, a man named Edwin Hubble after whom a telescope was subsequently named. Uh, and what, what helped solve this was simply better equipment. Uh, and in fact, 
starting kind of a trend uh, that has continued for a century now. What happened was, uh, so uh, Hubble was out in California where there are nice clear skies and uh, persuaded a, 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 a rich man to give a lot of money to build a really big telescope. Uh, this was a 100-inch telescope. That's the diameter of the uh, 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 the diameter of the uh, mirror. This is actually still in use, uh, although the site is no good because it's way too near to the lights of San Francisco. But uh, uh, he took this brand new telescope, he looked at the spiral nebulae, and he did the same thing to the spiral nebulae that Galileo had done to the, uh, to the Milky Way. He resolved it into individual stars. And he could see the individual stars in these spiral nebulae and discovered in the nearest of them uh, uh, that, um, uh, that they were made up of stars. And then he noticed that the stars that were making them up were incredibly faint. And that even the brightest stars in these things were incredibly faint. And so he inferred the distance to these things by assuming that you know, they're kind of ordinary stars like any other kind of stars, except they're way, way fainter. And therefore, they must be much further away. And this was compelling evidence that these spiral nebulae really were island galaxy, island universes, galaxies like our own. And uh, the key thing to do that is to have a telescope powerful enough to resolve uh, some of the nearby examples into individual stars. So there are many galaxies. And this was known shortly after the uh, Great Debate took place. And that made the universe very much larger than people had previously suspected, because there are all these galaxies around. So Hubble was the great expert at observing galaxies. And so the next thing he decided he would look at is, OK, now we know these things are galaxies. Uh, let's check out their, you know, he took Doppler shift measurements. He's trying to figure out the motions of galaxies. Um, and so he discovered a very strange thing, namely that they are all going away from us. Every galaxy he measured was redshifted. Uh, and so by, uh, by the usual Doppler shift interpretation of these things, they must all be moving away from us. And Hubble went further, and he created a, a, one of the most famous diagrams in all of astronomy uh, in which he plots redshift, uh, which is to say z, which is to say uh, radial velocity divided by the speed of light, at least in the Newtonian approximation, which he was working in, uh, versus distance. So he figured out how far away these uh, galaxies are, were. He measured their redshift. Uh, and what he discovered is that these things were very tightly correlated. So if you plot each galaxy, measure a distance and a redshift for each galaxy for a large number of galaxies, what you find is that they line up like this. This is the so-called Hubble diagram. And it's basically the thing we're going to be talking about for the next five weeks or so, is Hubble diagrams and what you can infer from them. Uh, and uh, the Hubble diagram can be sort of summed up uh, in an equation. Uh, if this is a straight line, then it must be true that the velocity of a given galaxy is equal to a constant, which was given the letter h for the Hubble constant, times the distance. This is Hubble's constant. And, uh, and, and that just basically says in algebra what this says pictorially, uh, that, they're, uh, that these things line up in a straight line. Uh, the Hubble constant is an extremely important number. Uh, you measure it by creating these Hubble diagrams and just measuring the slope of the line. Uh, and the uh, primary scientific purpose of the Hubble Space Telescope, the largest and most expensive science project ever created, was to get an accurate measurement of the Hubble constant. So all these beautiful pictures you see are byproduct. 
constants. Uh, the purpose of the thing was to measure the Hubble constant accurately. There had been, for many years, a dispute over what the correct value was. This was resolved by the Space Telescope and other things within the past decade. Uh, and this was a big success. We now know what the Hubble constant is. It's measured in somewhat weird units. Uh, it's uh, 70 or so kilometers per second per megaparsec. All right, now let's pause there for just a moment. Uh, you can see why they use this peculiar unit, uh, because you want they're measuring velocity in kilometers per second, and they're measuring distance in megaparsecs. Mega, of course, uh, doesn't just mean big. It's a technical term. It means a million. It means 10 to the 6 parsecs. A parsec, you will remember, is about 3 light years, uh, or 3 times 10 to the 16 meters or 3 times 10 to the 13 uh, kilometers. Uh, and so for each megaparsec that a given galaxy is away, and notice now we've changed our units from parsecs, which we use for stars, to megaparsecs. That's basically the change in the scale of the universe that came about when people realized that the spiral nebulae were galaxies. Uh, so now you have to talk about megaparsecs. In fact, now we also talk from time to time about, about gigaparsecs, which are billions of parsecs. Um, for each megaparsec that a galaxy is away from us, it moves 70 kilometers per second more <coughs> away from us. So something that's 10 kiloparsecs away uh, ought to be moving 700 <coughs> kilometers per second. Something that's 100 megaparsecs away would be moving 7,000 kilometers a second uh, away from us. And that's just an expression of what this relationship is. Hubble, by the way, got this quite wrong. Uh, he, 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 he correctly uh, lined them all up. Uh, but his value for the Hubble constant turned out to be about 500 in these units, which was quite wrong. Uh, and we'll talk about that, uh, why that was uh, uh, later on. But, ne but by now, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we totally know this. Uh, and that's uh, an important result. Now, this, is, this diagram and this relationship are basically the key to what we're going to be talking about. So uh, in fact, this. The fact that there's this linear relationship tells you several things. It tells you that the universe is expanding. Uh, and, in, and because of that, it tells you that the uh, indirectly, there's other evidence that has to be brought to bear as well, that the Big Bang exists. So this is the basis of Big Bang cosmology. I don't want to talk about that right now. We'll talk about the Big Bang on Tuesday. We'll have a whole big question and answer session. So bring all your questions about uh, the Big Bang and cosmology. We'll do that all up on Tuesday. Uh, what I want to talk about now is much more mundane. Uh, namely, how do you measure these points? How do you do this? How do you create this diagram? Uh, this diagram has these fabulous implications. Uh, but in order to understand what's going on, you'd better know uh, uh, how you get the, the diagram in the first place. Now, part of it's clear. The x-axis uh, we understand fairly well. Measuring radial velocity. Uh, that's easy. That's just the Doppler shift. So that comes directly out of uh, a particular kind of measurement that you can readily, readily do. Uh, the y-axis is the biggest problem in all of astronomy, namely, how do you measure the distance to something? And if you think about it, that's what the, this great debate was all about. Uh, some people thought that the distances to these spiral nebulae were a few hundred or maybe a few thousand parsecs. Other people thought they were millions of parsecs away. And it wasn't clear which was right. And if you think about looking up into the sky, looking at stars in the sky at night, uh, it's, uh, it, you can see where there's a problem. You look up there, you see a bunch of stars, and suddenly one of them shoots across the sky. It's a shooting star. Uh, they don't, uh, except for the motion across the sky, they don't look that different. And yet, some of the, the, the fixed stars are uh, hundreds of light years away. The planets, which look much the same to the naked eye, are uh, you know, uh, uh, a million times closer. And that shooting star is in the top of the atmosphere. Uh, and it's very hard to tell uh, what the distance is when you just kind of look up there. And so distance is hard. <coughs> and 
And that's uh, uh, basically uh, the problem I want to talk about for the rest of today's class. How do you measure distances? Yes? You said that, that um, redshift is, is easy, but how do we know what the original uh, wavelength oh, was? Oh, uh, so how do you know what the original wavelength was? You make the assumption that uh, atomic physics and chemistry are the same in the distant galaxies as they are here, and therefore hydrogen should emit lines at the same frequency as they do in the atmosphere. Now, uh, one of the things you can do if you don't like what the cosmological implications of things is you can say, well, rather than interpreting this as, as cosmology, let's just say that in distant portions of the universe, physics is different. As if, if, if you go down that road, uh, you can get any answer you want. Uh, and this has been seriously discussed from time to time. Uh, all right. So how do you measure distance? That's the key. Well, there's one and only one uh, kind of direct way you could imagine doing this. Here's the sun. Here's the Earth going around the sun. Uh, Earth. Uh, here's uh, a nearby star. And here are a bunch of other much further away stars. They're all scattered around the sky. And you observe this nearby star uh, during the course of the year. As the year goes on, uh, you observe it repeatedly. You observe it from here, for example. Uh, and when you observe it from here, it's in this direction. Whoops. It's in this direction. And therefore, it appears to be uh, in that position relative to the other stars. Whereas, when you observe it here, uh, it's uh, in a little bit of a different <coughs> position with respect to the other stars. It looks like it's here. And so if you observe this star repeatedly over the course of the year, it appears to move back and forth against the background of the other stars. This is a triangle. Uh, we know what to do about triangles. Uh, you can measure this angle uh, because that's just the angular separation of the two apparent positions of this star in the sky. We know this distance. That's one astronomical unit because this is the Earth going around the sun. Uh, and then what we want to know is the distance to this star, d. Uh, let's call that d1. And we know the equation for this already. We've done this before. This is alpha equals d2 over d1, uh, where uh, d2 in this case is exactly one astronomical unit. And you may recall that if you measure this in arc seconds, and you measure this in parsecs, and you measure this in au, uh, you get a consistent set of answers. Uh, and so uh, uh, one, the way it works out is 1 over alpha in arc seconds equals the distance in parsecs. And the reason that works is because d2 by this method is always equal to one astronomical unit. If you try this on Jupiter, uh, you have to account for the fact that Jupiter's further away. Uh, this is called the parallax method. It's common in surveying. You know, you look at the same thing from two different places. You can figure out distances by uh, basically trigonometry here. This is called the parallax method. Uh, and a parsec, this is the definition of a parsec, is one parallax second. It's a contraction. Uh, because you measure an arc second, and the distance uh, is one parsec. And that is the definition of a parsec. That's why we use parsec as a distance measurement, because it comes naturally out of uh, this parallax method. Uh, and so that's a fairly direct geometric method. You know, This is a surveying technique. This is, how, this is a straightforward way of getting the distance. And the problem with this is that it only works on things that are really nearby, because we can measure you know, a, maybe a hundredth of an arc second change in position. Uh, but no better than that, and so you can only get measurements of distances in this way out to a few hundred parsecs. Works to a kind of maximum, given our current instrumentation, uh, of a few hundred parsecs. 
but the center of our galaxy is 8,000 parsecs away. These other galaxies are megaparsecs away. We can't be measuring one one millionth of an arc second, at least not at the moment, in terms of parallax. So this only works for the very nearest stars. And that's why uh, there was all this confusion about the spiral nebulae, because you know, if they were 500 parsecs away, you'd never be able to tell. So most other distance measurements, methods of distance, are some form of what's called the standard candle method. <coughs> so here's how the standard candle method works. Uh, it's a three-step process. Uh, part one, uh, you look at something, you know how bright something is, how bright something is. This is basically a version of what Hubble did when he figured out that the spiral nebulae must be very, very distant and must therefore be island universes. You know how bright something is. In the case of Hubble, uh, he's looking at the brightest stars in the galaxy. He figures they're about as bright as the brightest stars in our own galaxy, so he knows how bright they are. Uh, part two, you measure uh, how bright uh, the object looks, you take a picture of it or you count photons or whatever it is that you do and you figure out how bright it looks. Uh, and obviously, if for something of a given brightness, the further away it is, the fainter it looks. And we know exactly how that works. It's a distance squared thing. If it's twice as far away, it's a fourth, it's a fourth as bright. If it's three times far further away, it's one-ninth as bright. It goes as one over the distance squared. Uh, this is a well-known fact. Uh, you, can, you can try this out with light bulbs at home. Uh, and uh, so if you know how bright it is and you measure how bright it, uh, uh, it appears to be, then you can compute the distance. Okay. Uh, and this is why it's called a standard candle. Oh, oh uh, so uh, the way this is, how do you know this? That's the big question. How do you know how bright the thing is in the first place? Uh, and the answer is uh, usually that, is that you're looking at something which is an example of a class of objects, like stars or bright stars, uh, whose uh, brightness is known. And that's why you use the term standard candle. Because here's a bunch of things. They're all the same brightness. They all have the same standard candle power. Some of them look fainter than others. The ones that look fainter obviously have to be further away. And if you know the true brightness of this class of objects, you can figure out how far away any example of it is. Uh, hence, standard candles. Uh, and the problem with this is this phrase here, as you can pretty clearly see. If you get it wrong, if you make the wrong assumption about how bright these objects are, you're going to screw this up completely. And that's what Hubble did. Uh, Hubble was looking at a, a, a particular kind of bright star, uh, and which he thought he knew how bright it was, and he was wrong. Uh, and uh, so he got the wrong Hubble constant. Now, because he used the same kind of star in all his galaxies, he got it the same amount wrong for all these different galaxies, so they still lined up. They just lined up along the wrong track. Um, so it was still true that something that he thought was twice as far away as something else was, in fact, twice as far away as something else. He just got both of those numbers wrong by the same factor. Okay. Uh, this brings us to the uh, awkward question of how do you measure brightness? And now we have to talk uh, about one of the uh, great impediments to learning astronomy, uh, namely the magnitude scale. Astronomers count brightness upside down and logarithmically. And I am now obliged uh, by my membership in the astronomical community to inflict this upon you. Uh, 
So the magnitude scale, this is how we measure brightness. It's upside down and logarithmic. And the key uh, uh, numerical relationship uh, that uh, works looks like this. If you subtract the magnitude of one object from another, uh, that equals minus 5 halves times the log of the ratio of the brightnesses. Don't panic. Uh, I, the magic word here is help sheet, uh, which will be posted later this afternoon. Uh, so this is a key equation. So let me, let me just define the terms. Uh, this is the magnitude of an object, of, of two different objects. Uh, and this is the brightness of the two objects, where by brightness, I mean something sensible, like how many photons per second uh, do you get from them, or, 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 or some other kind of uh, uh, true measure of how bright they are. Uh, now, uh, this is a somewhat awkward equation because it's a relative equation. It doesn't tell you what the magnitude of either one of these things is. What it tells you is uh, the magnitude of one compared to another. So in order to figure out the magnitude of something, you have to know the magnitude of something else. Uh, and so you need one other piece of information to have this be useful, which is that they have defined a particular star to have magnitude zero. Uh, the star vega is defined uh, to have magnitude zero. Uh, and so if you start with vega, you can figure out the magnitude of any other uh, given object. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, this is now causing trouble because it turns out that in the far infrared, vega is variable. Uh, and that's kind of unfortunate for the uh, uh, basis of the whole magnitude system to turn out to be variable. Uh, but uh, they've coped with that in various ways. All right, let me pause and remind you of some things about logarithms, uh, which you may have forgotten. Uh, what's the definition here? The logarithm of 10 to the x is equal to x. That's the definition of a logarithm. Uh, so uh, for the example, uh, the logarithm of 3 times 10 to the 2 uh, is equal to the logarithm of 10 to the 1 half, that's 3. Uh, times 10 to the 2 is equal to the logarithm of 10 to the 2.5, because when you multiply 10 to the x by 10 to the y, you get 10 to the x plus y, uh, which is equal to 2 and a half. That's an example. Uh, more examples on the help sheet. Uh, just in general, the logarithm of 10 to the x times 10 to the y is equal to x plus y. Because when you add those together, that's how it works. Uh, the logarithm of 10 to the x uh, divided by 10 to the y is equal to x minus y, again, because of the way uh, logarithms multiply together. Uh, and the logarithm of, let's see, 10 to the x raised to the mth power is equal to m times x. This, by the way, is why logarithms are so incredibly useful. Uh, you should always do all your arithmetic in logarithms. Uh, you should just automatically convert everything in your head into logarithms. In fact, in the days before calculators, this is how people used to do arithmetic. This is how slide rules work, I should say. Uh, they mark the thing off logarithmically, and then you move them back and forth. Uh, and people, you know, if you memorize like 10 logarithms of a few convenient numbers, you can do all sorts of calculations in your head because multiplication turns into addition, which is much, much easier to do. And so if you can convert things into logarithms in your head, then all you have to do is add numbers. That's easy. Uh, similarly, taking something to the nth power, for example, uh, taking the square root of a number or taking the cube of a number or something like that reduces down to multiplication. Uh, it's hard to take a square root of a number in your head, but it's easy to divide a number by 2, which is the equivalent of taking a square root. So if you're thinking in logarithms, all you got to do is divide it by 2, and you can amaze your friends by doing square roots in your head, uh, if your friends are the kinds of people who are amazed by that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> mine are. Uh, 
<laughs> and uh, so I recommend this to you. You know, if you have to prove that you learned something in college, uh, spend a half hour memorizing ten, 10 different logarithms and then just blow people's minds by taking square roots on bets. Uh, okay. Uh, or you can do problem sets in Astronomy 160. Uh, for example, uh, Sirius, the star Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky, uh, is about three times brighter uh, than Vega. So what's its magnitude? What's its magnitude? Well. Uh, let's write down the equation. Magnitude of Sirius minus the magnitude of Vega is equal to minus 5 halves log of the brightness of Sirius divided by the brightness of Vega. Now, uh, uh, anytime you see 3 times brighter or 20 times fainter or anything uh, of that kind, what you're really talking about is a ratio. If Sirius is 3 times brighter than Vega, that means the brightness of Sirius divided by the brightness of Vega is 3. That's what that statement means. Uh, and so we can just plug it right in. 5 halves log of 3. Because uh, 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 Sirius is 3 times brighter than Vega, so that ratio is equal to 3. What's the log of 3? 1 half. Thank you very much. Uh, this is equal to minus 5 halves log of 10 to the 1 half. You will remember that the square root of 10 is 3. Uh, so uh, 3 is also equal to pi, but for, for, for logarithms, uh, uh, the important thing is that 3 is equal to the square root of 10. Uh, and so this is minus 5 halves times 1 half uh, minus 5 fourths. Now, the uh, magnitude of vega, we know that's 0. So the magnitude of Sirius is equal to minus 5 fourths. This is what I mean by the fact that the scale is upside down. Uh, the brighter the star is, the, the lower, or uh, if it goes through 0, more negative the number becomes. Minus 1 is a brighter star than 0. 0 is a brighter star than 2. 2 is a brighter star than 5, and so forth. Uh, and so low numbers are bright. The magnitude of the sun, obviously extremely bright when we look at it, turns out to be minus 26 and a half. Uh, and uh, uh, the magnitude of the faintest star that can be seen with the Hubble telescope is about plus 30, so which is incredibly faint. Uh, and that, by the way, is why, again, why logarithms are such good news. Because the entire range of things we can see in the sky goes from minus 26 to plus 30. Those are numbers you can get your mind around. Uh, uh, in fact, the difference in brightness between those things uh, is a number that I can't even pronounce. Uh, and uh, uh, so much easier to deal uh, with magnitudes. All right. Now. That has to do with how bright things are, uh, uh, how bright things, uh, how bright things appear to be, or how bright they are. But uh, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to compare how bright something is intrinsically to how bright it looks. And this gets you into the question of there are actually two kinds of magnitude: the intrinsic brightness of an object uh, is something called absolute magnitude. Whereas the observed brightness is referred to as apparent magnitude. <laughs> and now the astronomers screw you up again because we have different symbols for the uh, apparent, brightness, apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude. The absolute magnitude is given a symbol capital M. And the apparent magnitude is given the symbol small m. And the problem is that you can't actually tell the difference between those two in my handwriting, uh, and probably yours as well. Uh, so uh, this leads to untold confusion, but that's the way life is. Uh, and the relationship between these two has to relate to distance. OK, before we get there, the definition of absolute magnitude
magnitude. You'll notice uh, that in the previous comparison of Sirius to Vega, I was talking about apparent magnitude, how bright it looks in the sky. Absol absolute magnitude is defined as the apparent magnitude if the object in question were exactly 10 parsecs away. So the sun has an, a, uh, an apparent magnitude, as I said before, of minus 26 and a half, but it's actually not that bright of a star. If you took the sun out to a distance of 10 parsecs, its magnitude would be 4.7, uh, so which is uh, among the fainter stars you could see in the sky. Uh, and so the absolute magnitude of the sun is 4.7, even though its apparent magnitude is minus 26 and a half. Uh, so it turns out, for example, that the star Sirius uh, is about three parsecs away. And so, uh, oh, I haven't told you an important thing yet. We'll come back to this in a second. The, the problem set problem, obviously, is going to be uh, how, what is the absolute magnitude of Sirius. But I, but I have to write down the formula first. Little m, that's the apparent magnitude, minus big M, that's the absolute magnitude. Uh, is equal to 5 times the logarithm of the distance over 10 parsecs. Now notice what happens. Uh, if the distance is equal to 10 parsecs, then you've got the log of 1. What's the log of 1? 0. Thank you very much, because this is the log of 10 to the 0. Log of 10 to the 0 is 0, and so if the log uh, uh, of this thing is 0, then this right-hand side is 0. So at a distance of 10 parsecs, the apparent magnitude is equal to the absolute magnitude, because m minus m is 0, which is exactly what the definition was. So that works. So example, serious. Uh, so how far, uh, so what is the absolute magnitude of serious? All right, here we go. Uh, the apparent magnitude we figured out just a minute ago uh, is minus 5 fourths minus the absolute magnitude, which is what we're trying to figure out, uh, 5 times the log of 3 over 10, which is a third, uh, which is equal to 5 times the log of 10 to the minus 1 half. Uh, 3 is 10 to the 1 half, 1 over 3 is 10 to the minus 1 half, which is minus 5 halves. But that 5 comes from here, the minus a half comes from here. Uh, so m is equal to 5 halves, um, let's see, minus 5 fourths is equal to 5 fourths. Uh, and that is the uh, absolute magnitude. I'm sorry? Oh, oh, you want me to do? OK, sure. So we OK to hear? So, oh, 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 OK, fine. Um, log of, this is actually an important point, log of a third, that's what we're going to try and do, uh, is equal to log of 1 over 10 to the 1 half. Uh, 1 over. 1 over 10 to the n is equal to 10 to the minus n. That's the key thing. And so this is the log of 10 to the minus 1 half. That then means that 5 times the log of a third is equal to 5 times minus a half is equal to minus 5 halves. Yes? Uh, there are no units. Yeah, magnitudes are just numbers. Yes? Ah, well, what I did, it, uh, uh, sorry, I skipped a step. To start from that, minus 5 fourths minus m is equal to minus 5 halves. So I multiply both sides by negative 1. <coughs> then I subtract 5 fourths from both sides. 
You got to keep the minus sign straight. The easiest way to make mistakes in this is to get the thing upside down and lose track of where your minus signs are, which is really easy to do because the whole scale is backwards. So, you know, minus 5 fourths is bright. Uh, whereas 5 fourths is faint. And so you're, one is constantly getting these things upside down. Be careful. Uh, look f at your answers to see it makes sense. If some incredibly faint galaxy turns out to have a magnitude of minus 50, that's almost certainly wrong because that's much brighter than the sun. Uh, all right. So now, uh, now we can actually do uh, the standard candle method. Here's the, here's the key problem. Uh, if you observe a star-like Sirius, and you, I don't know, you take its spectrum, or, or some alien comes down and tells you this star is just like Sirius, or, or, or however you work this out. If you observe a star like Sirius and measure its apparent magnitude, to be 8.75, how far away is it? And now we're back to where we were 20 minutes ago before I started all this nonsense. Namely, we're trying to measure the distance of something, which was the whole purpose, as you may recall. Uh, so how far away is it? Uh, let's see. M minus m is equal to 5 log d over 10 parsecs. Uh, the apparent magnitude is 8.75. Uh, the absolute magnitude we just figured out is 5 fourths. 1.25 is equal to 5 log d over 10 parsecs. And you'll notice I've chosen my numbers carefully because this is going to work out well. Uh, this is 7.5. And I'm going to divide both sides by 5. 7.5 over 5 is equal to the log of d over 10 parsecs. Or 1.5 is equal to the log of d over 10 parsecs. Now what do I do? Yeah, exactly. You have to take 10 to the power of both sides. Uh, whenever you're stuck with log of something, but you, and you don't want the log of the something, you want the actual something itself, what you got to do is 10 to the 1.5 is equal to 10 to the log d over 10 parsecs. 10 to the log of anything is equal to itself, so this is d over 10 parsecs. Uh, and thus, what's 10 to the 1.5? 30. Yes, 10 to the 1.5 is equal to 10 to the 1 times 10 to the half is equal to 3 times 10 to the 1 is 30. So 30 is equal to d over 10 parsecs, and d is equal to 300 parsecs. And for the person who asked about units, which was a very good question, this is where the units come back. It's because there's this 10 parsecs embedded inside <coughs> the equation. And so the unit of length comes back here. And so that's how you measure distance. You know how bright something is, probably by having looked at some other more nearby example. Uh, you measure how bright it looks. You compare those two things, and out pops the distance. So uh, this is done usually in the form of what's called the distance ladder, which we will uh, talk about much more in section. So you'll get many more opportunities to do this. Nearby stars. You measure the distance in parallax from the parallax method. Then you find examples of similar stars. Uh, you know, you measure uh, the apparent magnitude. You assume. Uh, the absolute magnitude to be the same as the absolute magnitude for things you already know the distance to. You assume the absolute magnitude, uh, and you compute the distance. This then gets you new, uh, uh, this tells you that you learn from this the uh, absolute magnitudes of magnitudes of brighter things. 
not just stars, but whole galaxies, supernovae, all sorts of things, brighter things, which you can then measure further away. And, and just to conclude, you can see pretty clearly that this method is fraught with potential problems. Because every time you go through this, you know, that's a swear word uh, in science. You're making an assumption, uh, and that assumption can lead you astray. And so the whole history of cosmology since 1925 is in that word, uh, assuming uh, the absolute magnitude of things for which you're trying to measure the distance so you can put them on the Hubble diagram so that you can deduce uh, the rate of the expansion of the universe and thus its age and ultimate fate. Uh, so it all rests on this little point embedded inside the standard candle method, uh, which will be discussed uh, at great length. Okay, that's it for today.